Eight years ago, the electronic sensor industry was demonopolized into six separate equal companies. These companies were Andrews, Baldwin, Chester, Digby, Erie, and Ferris. Many wondered how the split would affect the industry. After the first year, it appeared that Ferris was going to lead the industry. Erie was dying. Everyone expected that this little company would not be able to keep up and that it would fail. Three years after the split, the industry crashed. The market was flooded with inventory and was gasping for error. Erie managed to keep reading though as its stock price only slightly dropped compared to others. At this point, investors and analysts realized that Erie was a company that was going somewhere. After the crash of the previous year, Erie managers were conservative and ended up stocking out of almost all products. While many analysts said that Erie shot themselves in the foot by doing this, Erie was about to thrive. Erie stock price next year nearly doubled. Overnight, Erie was leading the market. Fast Tracks Magazine front cover posted, Watch out, Sensor World, Erie has arrived. Here's Alex Orton of Erie Industries, and we've asked him what his thoughts are on Erie's underproducing and stocking out. Um, you know, we just felt at that point in the game that, um, you know, it wasn't worth the risk for the little potential of a reward. Here's Mark Tensmeyer, COO of Erie Industries, and we wanted to ask him today, what led to Erie's huge jump in stock price? Well, uh, after five years of the investments we made in automation and total quality management finally paid off, and so our profits went up, and with that, investors um, wanting to invest in us went up too, and so our stock price went up too. All right, here we have Andrew Mickelson, CEO of Erie. What changes do you see happening with your product for the next year? Uh, well, you know, that's something that you're always wondering about. And we're just going to keep moving our products how we've been moving them. We've just been keeping them up to date in the sweet spot of each market. Um, we're just going to continue to do that. Um, we've made some forecasts for next year, too. We're predicting sales of over $200 million, um, ROS of 30%, ROA of nearly 50%, ROE of 50%. Um, an EBIT of nearly $100 million. And we can say this all with a high confidence. We uh, expect great returns next year. Alex, could you give us a little bit of info about your competition? Well, we had um, you know, those five other companies that were, we were pretty equal at the beginning. Um, the different strategies we had is they tend to look towards the present and the now and what was going to be the, the best benefit of today. But instead, we took the strategy of looking towards the future and Definitely paid off in the later years of our company. This is Mark Tensmeyer again with us. Mark, what is the mission statement of Erie? Well, the idea we had when we first started that we all came up with was that we would provide quality products for all customers in all segments. And if you look at our stats now, it's exactly what we've done. We have the perfectly placed products in all segments, the best selling in all segments, and the highest rated too. Hey, again, we have Andrew Mickelson, CEO. Now, tell us, what are your plans for automation and further investments in your plants? And how is that going to affect your debt? Um, well, in the beginning, we made a lot of investments in automation. And right now, I can say we have the highest automation possible. We have the most high-tech factories out of anybody else. Um, there's nothing else we can do there. Capacity, we still need to build up capacity a little bit. And we can do that safely with the amount of profits we're bringing. But with our debt now, we're going to start retiring it. Our plan for the next two years is to completely retire all long-term and short-term debt. We have the capacity now. Now we're going to do it. How would you guys say that Erie worked together as a team? That's an interesting question. We actually had, um, we worked pretty well as a group, but we definitely had two rounds that we really did not agree at all. And yeah. we definitely saw the, um, <laughs> the impact of not working as a team. We definitely didn't do as well as we could have yeah, in, this, in the two years that we uh, didn't have a consensus and really didn't agree, um, one year our stock price went down, and the next year our stock price just went up a little bit. Um, if we would have agreed as a group, you know, we probably would have done better. And you can see that from that, what happens when we do that. I would say, above all, at the very beginning, we all kind of had the same vision for what we wanted to do with this. We wanted to have the best product. We really all came up with the same idea about where we wanted it placed. Um, we also we wanted to get our automation levels up in the very beginning. So uh, that part we were all pretty much on the same page with. I mean, yeah, would you guys agree with that? Yeah, because when money was tight, we had 
issues deciding where we wanted to put what money where. At the beginning we had the same vision, but then as soon as money got tight we started not agreeing. And you know, that led to both our critical problems. Both times when we had problems it was because of us not agreeing. As soon as we agreed our stock price jumped. Right. And when things started going well, it was easy for us to agree on everything. Like, for example, I remember um, a couple of years ago when we said, hey, let's introduce a new product now. And I thought, at first, my reaction was, what? Why? I mean, all this money invested in now, but I said, you know what? Um, let's go for it. And we did. And it's actually been quite a good investment. 